most enormous respect. That's show tango. It's very skilled. Um, uh, heaven knows, you know, she was taken off the street. In her case, it's Coronation Street. And, um, and, and, and brought to a point where she could do something like that. I think from our point of view, we need to notice that um, there were lots of things in there that were to signal sexual undercurrent. You know, there's something going on there. If it weren't for the music and the fact that everybody was watching, they'd probably just, you know. Um, so um, that, that is essentially one of the, the main messages of show tango and what is a, a dynamo for it, in a way. Um, sorry, I don't have a remote. Oh, yes, and there we are with the famous sort of, that sort of strange pose. I don't know if you've ever asked yourself where your gender comes from. If you haven't, do it now. Um, is it something that you think you just have, you just are, you don't choose it, you don't make it? Um, it's possible that uh, we can have a, a listen to somebody who's thought about this and has some ideas. I'll play you what she says. Most of she's just speaking in plain language here. Judith Butler, um, or is she, has written a great deal, some of it pretty inscrutable. Um, but we're using queer theory, so we're going to work well, very gently. We're going to have a listen to Judith Butler. Here is Judith, and this. Oh, yes, sorry. This is this is absolutely central. Um, in terms of gender, she makes a distinction between gender performed and gender that is performative. Performative is a tricksy word. So listen carefully to what she says about it, and see whether you think she's describing something real. Every one of us has a body of knowledge to draw on, which is that in the course of our lives, we are or we are taken for a man or woman, or maybe something in between. But it's part of everybody's life, so it's sort of inescapable. It's one thing to say that uh, gender is performed, and that's a little different from saying gender is performative. When we say gender is performed, we usually mean that we've taken on a role, we're acting in some way, um, and that our acting or our role playing is crucial to the gender that we are and the gender that we present to the world. To say that gender is performative is a little different because for something to be performative means that it produces a series of effects. We act and walk and speak and talk in ways that consolidate an impression of being a man or being a woman. Now, we act as if that being of a man or that being of a woman is actually an internal reality or something that's simply true about us, a fact about us. Actually, it's a phenomenon that's being produced all the time and reproduced all the time. So to say gender is performative is to say that nobody really is a gender from the start. I know it's controversial. But that's my claim. And that's her claim. Um, just leave that sort of hanging in the air and think about it as we review some of the evidence that's coming along now. If she were here, she might be asking, and she might be able to answer the question, is gender in queer tango performed or performative? And we will come back towards that, that at the end. But for our purposes, and I'm extremely mindful of the things that you're um, um, about to embark on in terms of your professions, I want to just turn it around a little bit. So we're going to ask, to what extent is gender in queer tango performed or performative? So far, so easy-ish. But the other bit is, if you were a performer, what difference does it make? What earthly difference does it make? It seems to me there's no point asking this question unless it has some consequences for things that you might do. And that's why we're going to be looking at the material that follows. But we're going to start by looking at tango. Not queer tango, tango. History and myth. We're going to draw a sharp distinction here between history, things that happen, and myth, which are the stories that we assemble in order to tell ourselves things about the past. And like um, all myths, well, let's have a look at this one. Possibly the most famous tango performance ever. Um, it's a large claim to make, but this had profound consequences. 1921, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, and somebody has added the music to this. This was a silent film. It's difficult 
for us to imagine cinemas in which people went in their thousands to watch films that had no soundtrack. So there was no sound, so there might be a pianist, or if you were lucky, there might be a few more instrumentalists, but at the minimum, a pianist generating music to drive the <coughs> plot forward. Nobody could speak unless words came up on a screen. It's a completely different way of doing things um, than the way we do things now. Oops, sorry. So. a 
the time. It's on marshland, but it is built out of nothing very rapidly because Argentina is getting very, very rich. Um, they have that agriculture now connected up by the railway, and at that time there was an expression, as rich as an Argentinian. It was that the society was people who were literally on the make, who, who believed that going there was going to make them rich, and there was a lot of money pouring through, and they tried and succeeded in <coughs> building a European capital city out of almost nothing. So that's the Avenida de Mayo. It looks a bit like that even now. Um, between 1869 and 1914, um, the population rose from a modest 180,000 to 1.4 million. So that is a thunderous increase. People are arriving all the time, the place is being built all the time. Now, we're going to have a tango creation myth. It's a myth. It's based on facts joined together in order to construct a narrative that is moderately convincing. Like all myths, it is not the truth, okay? It's a myth that embodies some truths. So, um, anybody, anybody at all, what do you notice about this picture of immigrants? Just call out. It's all men. There is one woman, yes? Very, very true. It's all men and there's one woman. Most of the immigrants who came to Buenos Aires had come from Italy, say, intending to come to be very rich men and go back and marry Maria. They don't go back. They stay. And as a consequence, this society is made up of about seven men to every woman. I want every woman in this room to think about what the consequences of that might be if you were thinking about a prospective husband. And bear in mind, of the women who are there, not all. Hmm, come on, keep moving. Okay, oh, there it goes. Not all women are identical. The um, government in Argentina decided that in order to try and make society stable, bearing in mind this disjuncture between men and women, they would have modern, legalized brothels. And it meant that of those women, good proportion were professional women in the sex industry. From the point of view of the polite women left, and of the men left who might want to marry, that reduced still further the ratio of marriageable women to men. There's masses of them. Um, so, as you can imagine, um, competition was fierce. Now, you can settle it with a fist fight, but as we've not got a lot of time, I'm skipping this bit. It's all very interesting, but we're not going to this is the house of a rich person. I was there earlier this year. I went in the house, a magnificent French house. Inside, they had a maquette for their new fireplace that they had commissioned from Rodin. For goodness sake. I mean, you know, it's just unbelievably wealthy people. The First World War happened, so they never got their fireplace, but it's just astonishing. Tango had been danced amongst the disadvantaged in this particular area. But amongst the disadvantaged included brothels. Rich men went to brothels, they danced the tango, they went to Paris, they impressed women and other parts of Europe. They impressed women with their tango, who thought it was fantastic. You get tango mania reaching a peak in 1913. Tango comes back to um, South America, and suddenly the, um, the, the, the bourgeois who had despised tango as a threat to national security, suddenly it becomes fashionable and they want it. So they say, no, 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 it's not French, it's Argentinian. And it marches from criminals into the salon. That's a really dense version of it. Now, this is the critical thing. In this society, characterized by dramatic gender imbalance, who danced with who? One of the ways in which a man might be able to meet an eligible woman was at a milonga, at a tango ball. So women might, and this, this part I'm saying, I've got a big footnote in here saying, this bit's contentious. The truth is we don't really know. There's conflicting evidence. Women danced with women at home. They tended to learn their dancing at home and then go out and dance. That would be a respectable way of doing it. For the men, they learnt, they danced, with one another. We have these images, they're astonishing. Um, this is an image from the street in 
26 of a group of men, perfectly ordinary men. This is not a sort of informal gay um, uh, convocation, as far as we know, which is fine. And they are dancing with one another. Um, there are many of these images. This is the racing driver, Fangio, um, during his military service, dancing tango with his fellow soldiers. Um, this is probably a football team. There's five couples there, and if you take one out to take the photograph, that's a complete football team. I'm guessing about the football team. I've got several pictures of the football teams of dancing tango, um, so it's, it's possible. In truth, what are we to make of these images? Christine Denniston comes up with a, an account, and she got this account. She was dancing in Buenos Aires in the 1990s, and she spoke to men who'd been alive at that time, and they said, when they learn to dance, they learn to dance at all male practicas. Okay, and a practica is like a it's like a place where people agree to meet and practice their dancing. Um, there are no teachers. Bear in mind this teaching model, given the one that you probably enjoy here. There are no teachers. The men teach one another. If the man was, say, I don't know, coming up sort of 18, 19, um, then one of his relatives might take him to an all male practica and he'd start by learning the follower's role. Only once he'd been able to do that really, really well, and when I say follower, I mean here effectively women's role, could he learn then to lead, lead another man, constantly getting feedback, whatever. And then eventually um, his sponsor might take him to a public milonga and to persuade a married woman perhaps to dance with him, and then the women got to see whether he was any good. Think about it from the women's point of view. They're not going to dance with an unknown quantity, so he has to be seen, and they're not going to dance with a jerk. So if they dance with somebody and dancing with them doesn't make them feel wonderful, they're not going to linger because there's a cue of them. So from the point of view of the kind of dancing that's being developed, the purpose of the social dance is for the man to make the woman feel fabulous. That's what it's about. The reason I'm starting with the social dance is there is a real contrast between the social dance and the performance, but we'll get to that in a moment. There is so-called Tango Golden Age, 1935 to 1955. Um, it starts when the dance bands start recording music for dancing rather than for singing, and it ends, um, yeah, we can go really fast here. We know who they are because we've seen the musical. Um, there's Juan Perón and Evita Perón, all comes to a bloody end, when I mean, you can imagine the Royal Air Force taking off from somewhere and then flying over London and bombing it. You've got some of the idea of what the revolution of 1955, sponsored by the CIA, was like. And it was shocking for Argentinians for this to occur. It was the beginning of a series of military juntas which ran the country as a dictatorship. And because it was sponsored by America, they effectively suppressed tango and sponsored rock and roll. They wanted young Argentinians to identify with Elvis Presley and with rock and roll, and tango became the dance of the parents, and there were precious little interest in it. Swiftly, swiftly, we know about these. We know what happened. Um, the economy of, of Argentina was going down the pan, so in order to generate public support, they invaded what they call the Malvinas. Um, logically, they thought um, Britain would do nothing because Britain was thousands and thousands of miles away. What on earth did they do? Well, that's what they did. We know about it. Um, effectively, because the Americans were the sponsors of the Argentinian government, but also best buddies with Britain, that was the end of that government. It collapsed. And the beginning of a democratic life in Argentina. So... In the Tango Renaissance, you have to imagine an impoverished country with young people looking for something that might be national identity. Tango, perfect. And if you can dance it, you can <coughs> earn money from it. So what that means is that after the general spell in 1983, tango shows start going around the world. That's what kicks off the Tango Renaissance. That's why, sorry it was a long way to get there, but that's why we know tango through performance. We know it through shows. We know it through the black and the red. And, the and of course, uh, nothing sells like sex. So making sure that the sexual quotient is well to the fore in show tango makes it a somewhat different animal to the social tango out of which it grew.
I said the language was a mind group. Queer can just be another word for LGBT, and a lot of people use it in that way. But it also has a formal theoretical meaning. If you think about it, if you're dancing in tango, you could locate yourself, if you chose, somewhere along that binary of straight or queer. You could. You could also locate yourself somewhere along that binary of woman, man. So you could, you know, plot something there. And then if you added a third dimension, you could decide whether or not you're, I'm sorry, leader is gone, that says leader, and that says follower. So what you've got in queer tango is effectively um, a space where, if you chose, you could do this, except we're talking queer tango. And what queer tango does is it takes that structure, if you like, and it considers femininity, and it considers masculinity, and then it blows it up and says, you don't have to refer to those binaries. You don't have to. It is not obligatory. Um, which makes for a very interesting thing. Yes, we're trying to blow the box. Um, I'll tell you what's in this video clip. It's great. It's Helen Lavikinger um, dancing with Adrian, who is a man. She's straight, he's gay. They start the sequence with them doing the conventional uh, format of him leading her, and halfway through they change for her leading him. Um, that would have been the point of that clip had I had time to show it to you. Um, this is a charming one. I think you might just watch a bit of this. this I, what I've done is I've put together a catalogue of queer tango performances so that we can consider this business of gender in terms of queer tango performance. This is one at an all-women festival in Buenos Aires um, earlier this year. And here they are. <laughs>
So in order to assert the fact that they are men, look at the colouring, look at the clothing they've chosen, very serious black. And for much of it, they're doing things mechanistically, impersonally, very beautifully, but very, you know, not a lot of that. And then the moment when actually it becomes about possible tenderness. And so then it turns into a fight. Because then you're on safe masculine territory. I say nothing. Um, I do say something. We're going to look at something that is almost the complete opposite of this later. In fact, let me see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would like you to see this. So here we are. Um, we're in Heidegger Kreuzkirche in Berlin this summer. And uh, Juan Pablo Ramirez and Daniel Arroyo have just completed a strange, sinister set where they're sort of Chinese figures. I, I, I can't play you the entire thing. You could do an entire lecture on this performance. I won't. Um, but then...
to the <laughs> black, red, blue, blue stuff. The complete opposite. This is two men, gay men, actually a couple. Um, but if we're doing queer tango, maybe we don't need to know all of that or refer to it. And what they're doing is they're exploring tenderness between men. And they're doing it in performance in public. In 2014, I think that was. I mean, you know, we're talking now. The world has changed in 15 years since Queer Tango first burst on it. And Queer Tango is reflecting some of those changes. Um, so, that's another one. We're nearly getting to the end. In fact, I think we're getting to the end. Oh, yes we are. She's back. <laughs> so, Judith Butler might ask me. I would ask the question, is gender in Queer Tango performer, performative? And we said, we'd ask, to what extent is gender in Queer Tango performative or performative? Okay? That's what we said we'd ask. We've now looked at some evidence. The sharp-eyed amongst you will notice as I go through this conclusion that there is no way that I could pretend to you that the things that I've shown you prove the things that I'm about to say. The conclusion is really little more than what I believe based on my experiences and what I've thought about. But what I have done is given you a chance to look at some of the things that make up queer tango performance. So you too can have a think about whether you think the things that I'm about to say are true or not. I suggest the answer to this is both inconveniently. So performances are performed. Ah, that's a really good conclusion, isn't it? I like that. Um, so, uh, in terms of gender, I think we can fairly safely say, um, yeah, gender is realised through performance. Job done. Um, so, from the show tango side of things, yes, it's performed. There are people a bit like yourselves, deliberately deciding, I will now do something in front of other people, and I will attempt to make them think and feel differently by how I move my body, or by how we move our body. Social tango is not performed as in intended to provide a spectacle. If I'm dancing social tango, social tango, I may be aware sometimes that people are watching, and I may sometimes slip into doing things just because I know they're watching, which is just scandalous, it's terrible. Um, but most of the time, um, what I'm doing is I'm trying with the partner that I'm dancing with, a man or a woman, or whether they're leading me or following me, to realize the dance most satisfactory to both of us. That's how the history stuff continues to inform how social tango is danced today. Because it's, nobody wants me to show off as a leader. They want me to make them feel wonderful. That much has come through to the present day. Gender is realized in social tango as in life through performativity. That is, and I'm using here Judith Butler's um, um, definition, through habitual physical repetitions, producing it intended, unintended, in between. They are, they're so habitual. I mean, that's why we, 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 we tend to think about gender as being natural, because we do it so easily that we think, well, it just is, just part of us, just is. She's suggesting that it might not be, and that's the question mark that you can live with for a day or two. And to what extent is gender in queer tango performative? performative? And if you are a performer, something you've observed.
observed and put it into a performance. You might reimagine it, you might exaggerate it, you might edit it, you might push it towards extremes of things that you want to engage in, particularly if you're going into choreography, it might be something you would think about. You might reject it, so you could decide, I'm going to come on, everybody will tend to think, don't forget we've got the fabulous sort of um, dressing up box of gender. So we can do all sorts of things, a bit like um, Juan Pablo Ramirez and Daniel Arroyo were doing. That's one way of rejecting, perhaps, the, the, the gender that people might tend to associate with you. But you might rejoice in it. You might find aspects of it that you just think are so fabulous they're worth dancing about. So all of those possibilities are there. This has been slightly more condensed than I had intended it to be, but we have
workshop, at the very least, you'll have the basics of tango. Okay.